Good afternoon, Oshkosh. How's everybody doing? And this is a fantastic day. Man, I would like to thank the Chamber of Commerce for the weather they've been giving us this week. It's just been unbelievable. Welcome to this afternoon's edition of Warbirds in Review. And a big, beautiful bird behind me it is. Um, I'm Chip Berger. I'm the voice of the Warbirds Living History Group. That's that cast of characters. And if you look among the, uh, the dog faces behind me, we're definitely a cast of characters. We have an encampment right over yonder. You can't miss it. It's all those... Uh, olive drab canvas uh, tents over there. Uh, so just keep looking towards olive drab or just follow your nose for the scent of musty canvas. We'd love for you to come by. We're in operations all during the, the uh, operations day of uh, Air Venture. Uh, come by, you can see some of this equipment up close and personal, get some of the history and meet a bunch of uh, uh, living historians, amateur historians who will talk your ear off about the war and answer any questions you might have. Uh, this is a real treat for us, uh, a plane like this. And uh, without too much further ado, uh, we're going to get into what we're doing here. What we try to do with this part of the pro with this part of the program, this portion of the program, is put a human face on the experience. What the guys looked like, what they wore, the equipment they used, and how that equipment changed over the time, or how that equipment was different in different theaters of the war, different countries, uh, etc. So this is more about the guys, the gear, the equipment, the uniforms, etc., versus the aircraft. All right. So let's start with the aircraft first. And we have a crew here, crewing the uh, C-47 Dakota here. We have an uh, air crew here. We have a pilot. Is that four, please? Actually, we have a nav navigator. We've got his navigation kit. Trusty A-2 uh, uh, jacket, sometimes called a bomber jacket. Foresight jacket that used protected from the elements. He's wearing a headset to communicate with the rest of the crew and also communicate with operations, although there was a lot of radio silence for uh, D-Day, for Normandy, for Overlord. Since we're flying over the channel, he, like most of the individuals here, is wearing a Mae West life vest, inflatable life vest type, and he is wearing a seat back parachute. This is called the Turtle. You can see why it kind of got its nickname, the Turtle Shell, etc. cetera. Um, typically, you see these used by pilots Kind of depended on the plane, kind of depended on their individual preference, whether they were wearing this or the seat back type. Okay? And we have his co pilot. Same thing, A2 jacket. He's got his trusty service sidearm, M1911 45 caliber pistol, just in case they get down, knocked down in the area of uh, hostile people. He's also got his headset ready to go. Life vest, again, same principle as the uh, when you get your safety briefing on the airliners and they tell you not to pull on the tabs to invest by uh, inflate your vest until you get outside the aircraft it's a similar thing there are co2 cartridges in here that inflate that and he's got hidden tubes inside of here that he can blow in just case those don't work you can turn around you see he's wearing the same type parachute and these are these are air crew type parachutes not paratrooper type parachutes next we have our load master Responsible for cargo loads, making sure everything's balanced off, center of gravity is right in the plane, getting things loaded on and off, like all the gear you see behind you. And since he is going to be moving about the airplane, wearing a parachute like this is impractical. So if you can turn around, you see that there's nothing back here, right? Turn around to the front. This is a parachute harness. This is the later war type. And you can see that there are hooks here. He would attack a chest pack type parachute similar to the reserve chute that you see down there, and he would grab that. It would be near his station. He would grab that, click that on before he jumps out of the aircraft. These airplanes don't fly themselves, and they don't work by themselves, and so we have in the background some crew, ground crew. we got a mechanic here working with mechanic to airport. He's also supervising, and we got another crewman supervising the load going on, sure, making sure things get set up, making sure the right stuff is going on the right plane in the right place. Uh, get a nice balanced load, uh, and uh, we have room for uh, paratroopers and what have you. Make sure everything's loaded up properly and correctly on the ground. Make sure the plane is surface, serviceable, ready to function uh, at a moment's notice. All right. So next, what I would like to do is come over here to the Commonwealth side. Private Klatmar here is going to tell you about the uh, servicemen that are behind him, kind of what they're carrying. The vehicles that are behind him and the like, and uh, kind of describe what they wore as far as the missions, uh, airborne missions in uh, in Western Europe, D-Day, Normandy, Market Garden, etc. 
Private Klapmeyer. The British Army, like most Allied countries, realized that they needed a light force that could be dropped behind enemy lines. The British had experience with the German Fallschirmjägers in the beginning of the war, and so they formed the Parachute Division. Not only did, was it made up of the Parachute Regiment, the cap bat that you see on my head, but also other regiments were involved. We have the South Wales, we have the, or the South Staff and the Border Regiment. We also have the RAF Regiment. Everybody working together with specialized assignments when they hit the ground. When the airboard jumped into battle, they are jumping into the middle of the battle. That means they are surrounded and they must be self-sufficient. Mobility becomes important. For most of them, the mobility is their feet. You drop your chutes, the British oftentimes drop their helmets, it gets heavy, putting it on their berets, which were colored maroon as a symbol of the parachute division, and then they would engage the enemy and push on to their assigned location. Other ways of moving were specially adjusted jeeps that were delivered by gliders. They have shortened pieces, excess stuff removed so that they could fit inside the glider. A Wells bike like this is collapsible. It's also considered disposable. They were not given extra fuel for it. When they used up the fuel in the bike, it's discarded and they went on by foot or hopefully they were at their spot. But this potentially gave them the ability to move quickly into the position that they need to be. Bicycles that could fold, this one from BSA, were often dropped to the parachute regiments so that they could quickly get to their assignment. Beyond that, the smock, called the Denison smock, every airborne was given that. It has snaps so that you could snap the bottom so you don't become a parachute in of yourself, as well as there was over smocks to be able to secure and keep the equipment that you're wearing secure and tight. Once you get to this point, the equipment is universal for every British soldier. 1937 patterned webbing, rifles, the same as the infantry, they were not shortened, made by Enfield. Boots, everything else was the same as a British soldier. The Denison smock, which became so identifiable with the parachute re regiment, was often acquired by other regiments because it is a great coat to wear. It's camouflaged. When you get beyond all of this stuff, we have for support, the light machine gun, the Bren, fires the same ammunition as the rifle, and every soldier would have one of his pouches full of just magazines to feed this. This is gonna keep the enemy's head down. For a light weapon, is the Sten gun, nine millimeter. The back can be, stock can be removed so it can be carried tight. Very light, not very accurate. But it was dependable, very simple to make. At the time, it cost less than $3 a piece to make this weapon. The parachute regiments and the regiments that joined the parachute divisions went through the same training. Rather than jumping from towers like the Americans had, they jumped from balloons. After that, they would be put into the airplanes, and the airplanes, by the end of the war, were all American-made. The DC-3 was a fantastic airplane to get out of. It carried a lot of equipment. It could tow gliders, so it was often used. The British would have their own personnel flying them, but it was American-made. So when you see the maroon beret, the different colored berets within the British military, it is the berets that help identify their assignment and their duties. Whether with the RAF or black berets if you are armor, any of those things 
can be used. So with that, I will turn it over to the Americans. Thank you, Private Klapmeyer, and thank you very much. All right, back to the US of A. Captain Blecky, would you please describe your troops, their equipment, their missions, et cetera? Very good, thank you, Chip. Um, can I have Private Zaharias and Ham step forward, please? We're now looking at something you'd have seen on uh, the night of June 5th, 1944, part of the invasion of Normandy, the largest seaborne invasion ever attempted at that, uh, at that time in history. We've got two paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division wearing the characteristic M42 jumpsuit and the polished Corker and jump boots, uh, items of which they were justifiably proud. It uh, set them apart like the Red Berets of the British Airborne. Um, we'll use uh, we'll use Zaharias here as an example since he has his uh, he has his full parachute on. Go ahead, Steve, turn around. You see that's a backpack type. Uh, he's holding up his static line that's going to be clipped over a uh, a cable that runs down the center of the aircraft. And when he, he when he step, jumps out the door, that will automatically pull the lanyard and rip the uh, the pack open and allow the drogue and the parachute to come on out. Now, if there's any problem with that, Steve, turn around. You've got, he's got a reserve chute on his chest. Uh, so if, if uh, <laughs> say two is one and one is none. So he's got a backup chute there just in case uh, something goes wrong with the main. If you see what's dangling down below that, that actually normally would be on his back, but of course there's no room right now because of the, uh, the pack type parachute. When he drops his parachute, when he gets to land, he's gonna flip that musette bag over his shoulders and that, that becomes his, uh, his, effectively his backpack with all his personal gear, food, supplies, spare socks, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of his personal equipment, you can see a number of unique items here. He's carrying a compass. He's, he's carrying a, you've got a sidearm buried under here somewhere. Uh, <laughs> there's a, uh, let's see, what else do we have? He, under, you see a little flash of yellow here. He, he is in fact wearing his, his B4 life preserver underneath all that. It is layers upon layers. You also notice on his right shoulder, you see this on a lot of, uh, a lot of troopers going into Normandy, this, this paper sleeve, this brassard, is intended to detect poison gas. We're still not convinced that the Germans aren't going to use it on us, so not only does he have that uh, brassard to detect it, but many of us are also carrying our gas mask bags to uh, protect us from it. Wearing a characteristic paratrooper model M1 helmet with a uh, leather chin cup, to secure that helmet from the, the shock of, uh, of the uh, slipstream in the aircraft, keep it from yanking it off his head. Now in terms of, uh, okay, he's got his equipment laid out in front of you. Now imagine, if you will, dropping in at night, uh, surrounded with people shooting at you, and you have to take your M1 rifle out of that padded bag, assemble it, before you can be begin fighting. Quite a challenge. You know, he's got a number, number of other items down here that would normally be strapped to his body, um, giving him, uh, you know, uh, as much as 100 pounds of, uh, of weight he's carrying when he's, as he's trying to egress the aircraft. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. Now let's, let's fast forward to September of 1944, the invasion of Holland, Operation Market Garden, Field Marshal Montgomery's gamble. We're going to lay down an airborne carpet and use it to cross the Rhine River with 30 Corps coming up the sing a single roadway through Holland and through three towns with half a dozen bridges. By this point, we've recovered the, uh, the airborne divisions from Normandy. They've been re-equipped, re and they, the Army's always trying to standardize. We're now standardized with the M43 uniform. You can see that it's, while it's similar, it's also different. It's all olive drab. They've lost their characteristic shiny jump boots there. Uh, Private Miller, or Corporal Miller, would you step forward? He's carrying much of the same equipment. If he turns around, you can say he now has the same Musette bag, but he's wearing the double buckle boots. He's not carrying a rifle, he's carrying a Thompson submachine gun, so he has a combat knife strapped to his leg. He's still wearing the 1926 model life preservers, the same as the guys crossing the channel, as opposed to the, uh, the uh, Air Corps type B3 and B4 life preservers that the, uh, the other gents have. And he's got the magazines for his weapon strapped to his belt, and he's also carrying a handheld radio in this padded bag. That is the characteristic handy talkie, good for about a mile's worth of communications on a good day on flat ground under great atmospheric conditions. He's also prepared to dig a, dig a trench with his entrenching tool so he can, he can uh, find some cover. Uh, 
Private Ryan, please step forward. This is, and I kid you not, Private James Ryan, who also uh, in his spare time is a uh, captain in the Air Force, but he decided to spend the weekend with us. He is equipped with the standard M1 rifle, uh, the characteristic battle weapon of the USGI in World War II. He has his assault gas mask bag. It's rubberized to protect it from the water, wearing his B3 vest, canteen, cartridge belt, his 96 rounds of ammo, and he's got a knife strapped to him as well. If you turn around, Tom. Now this, is a, this is called a haversack. It's similar to, but an earlier model for carrying your, uh, your personal equipment. He's got the bayonet for his rifle attached to that. So as the, uh, as the leader of this, uh, this happy band, I have a few extra doodads attached. Got a map case, got my binoculars. Somewhere under here, there's a compass. Chip? Thank you very much, Captain Blecky. And how about a hand for our American Airborne <laughs> Infantry? And again, similar to the uh, organization uh, and approach, uh, strategy and tactics that Private Clamar described, again, with uh, in, in Normandy and Overlord and in Market Garden, which was the jump into Holland, you had a, a division of labor, if you will, between parachute infantry regiments, guys jumping out of perfectly good airplanes like this with parachutes, and glider infantry. Uh, the thought being that uh, the parachute uh, regiment uh, to troopers might get spread all over based on the fact that they're jumping out of an airplane and have to kind of get things together. Combat gliders were used in both of those operations of different sizes. Uh, the British had three, the Americans had one, and uh, one of the British ones was used by both the Americans and the British. So you had the, uh, the, the Waco with the American combat glider, you had the Horsa, which was a plywood glider by the British, was used by both, and then they had a, a, a giant one called the Hamel car that could take vehicles. Uh, but the idea was a combination of efforts that if you come in with a combat glider like the, the Waco, you've got 13 guys armed, ready to go, all their equipment, they don't have to find and, uh, and collect all their equipment, they're, they're in a position where they can get ready to go and maybe uh, protect or get ready to prepare or defend uh, a landing zone for other troops. Um, likewise, they could land with a jeep. Jeeps were brought in in a number of different ways, but they could land with a jeep. Uh, the American uh, combat glider, the nose went up, you could drive a jeep right out of it. You could go to another Waco combat glider, CG4, and you could pull a howitzer right out of it, and you're ready to go. Where the pack howitzer breaking down for airborne operations dropped from one of these, you got three bags. And if you got only two out of the three bags, guess what? You're not going to be shooting anything at anybody. So different philosophy, but it was used in both places. You had parachute infantry regiment and glider infantry regiments in, in the same both, you know, British Paris and British gliders, riders, et cetera. Um, so thanks. Uh, we got a couple minutes here for a couple, maybe a couple of Q&A here. Uh, questions from the crowd? I think we have a little bit of time. Okay, the question, if I understood it correctly, question was what was the top end load as far as rifle ammunition for the riflemen and uh, hand grenades? Probably a different answer in different situations. I'm going to Hand that back, if you don't mind. Well, when you're not sure when resupply is coming, uh, you tend to overload. If you look at uh, Mr. Ryan here, he has not only his basic cartridge belt uh, filled with uh, clips of ammunition, he's also carrying some bandoliers with spare ammunition in it. So he could, uh, he, he could have uh, upwards of uh, 200 rounds on him. And over for the answer from our British cousins, uh, Private Clapmire got into it a little bit in the fact that in addition to carrying rounds of ammunition for their own Enfields uh, and the like, they would also carry magazines that snap into the top of the Bren. So typical max loadout jumping into France or jumping into Holland. Most paratroopers, when they left the door, were carrying at least 100 pounds of extra equipment on their body. So that gives you an idea of what they had to drop with. And again, some of this also, the, uh, the answer varies because not everybody is carrying the same weapon, right? So obviously someone who is carrying a Thompson 
you know, it's so much more limited in terms of magazines. You know, these are larger magazines that fit on the Thompson versus the smaller en bloc clips that go into the M1 rifles. And if anybody was jumping with a, an M1903 rifle, et cetera, and similar on the British side, whether it's a Lee Enfield versus a Sten or a Brand Carrier, but a lot. I hope you get a feel for the answer. The answer is quite a bit. Yes. Loaded, fully loaded paratrooper pack, everything on them, parachute pack, stores, leg bag, et cetera. When you, when you guys jumped uh, out of, for, uh, you know, say, say the Normandy operation, what they had for that particular one, how much would you be overloaded? I would probably, as a smaller guy, I'd probably have at least my weight. And um, a lot of the smaller guys were also uh, heavy weapons if they would like mortarmen like Pee Wee Martin, et cetera. So they usually got a lot of the heavier equipment. And it also had to do with the send rate. So you load it out, the guy's about the same weight. So double your weight and there you go. All right, we gotta get moving on here. Gotta turn the ramp over to Ms. Teresa Eamon. Uh, how about you give yourselves a nice warm round of applause for being such a great audience. Those are two excellent questions, Why? Excellent, excellent questions. And again, please come see us. Uh, we'd love to show you all this stuff up close and personal so you can get some photographs with all of this. Chip Berger, Voice of Warbirds Living History Group, signing off. Enjoy the rest of the day. See you tomorrow. Thank you, gentlemen. And folks, if you would, visit the reenactors. They're in their camp just to your left. If you look down the road, there's the green canvas tents. They'd be happy to show you all their gear that they put this time and effort into putting together. And welcome to the Thursday afternoon of War Birds in Review. In just a few moments, we'll be having the presentation of this beautiful C-47 Skytrain you see in front of you. But before we do that, and also if you're in the Warbirds area, please make your way over here to the grandstands in our Warbirds in Review area as you, uh, we get ready to do this presentation. But before we do, we have a lady that's going to give you a bit of in, 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 entertainment, thank you, uh, singing entertainment, thank you, uh, singing songs from the era. If you would, please welcome Miss Teresa Eamon. Thank you very much. It's good to see a lot of faces that I recognize, and it's good to see some faces I don't recognize. Uh, my name is Teresa. I have been singing here now for 10 years. Um, I come from North Carolina, just outside of Charlotte in a small town called Monroe. And I can tell you that your weather here, no matter how good or bad it is, is better than what we have there right now. So I am not complaining about the wind, the rain, the snow, or any of it. Uh, because who knows, we may see some before the week's over. Uh, but for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna sing some songs from the 1940s era. And I'm gonna start, since we have British and American uh, groups represented here today, with a song from one of the most iconic British entertainers from the time period, Miss Dame Vera Lynn. And this was a great song because uh, it talked about the hope that people had for life re renewing after the Blitz. So this is a great song called When the Lights Go On Again. When the lights go on again All over the world and the boys are home again all over the world then rain or snow is all that may fall from the skies above a kiss won't mean goodbye but hello to love when the lights go on again all over the world and the ships will sail again all over the world then there'll be time for things like wedding rings and free hearts will sing when the lights go on again all over the world
than rain or snow is all that may fall from the skies above a kiss won't mean goodbye but hello to love when the lights go on again all over the world and the ships will sail again all over the world then there'll be time for things like wedding rings and free hearts will sing when the lights go on again all over the world thank you very much that was a song that I had only known in passing and then learned um, during COVID when I had an opportunity to sing for an online concert based inside the hangar at the Military Aviation Museum in uh, Virginia Beach. And if you were here earlier this week, of course, you got to hear Jerry Yagan speak who's sitting out there because he always likes when I sing a little Vera Lynn uh, because he's got an amazing collection of British uh, airplanes and memorabilia. And I always like to give a heads up to the people that, that, that really dealt with the war the worst of it, you know, the blitz bombing was a nightmare that I don't think many of us could even begin to imagine. And so I always like to give a little heads up to them. Now, the music from this time period was also very uplifting. Um, and there were a lot of uplifting songs and entertainers who were part of the USO tours. And this is one of those great songs that was sung by a whole lot of people. This particular version is my favorite. It's a song called All I Do Is Dream of You. All I do the whole day through is dream of you. With the dawn, I still go on dreaming of you. Your every thought, your everything, your every song I ever sing, summer wind. spring and we're there more than 24 hours a day they'd be spent in sweet content dreaming away when skies are gray when skies are blue morning noon and night time too all I do the whole day through is dream of you.
you very much. So if you're watching online on airtoairtv.com and you see me wiggling my fingers, it's usually at a kid who's sitting out in the audience reacting positively to the music. And part of what I do and my goal, and really the goal of Warbirds in Review, is to bring the history and the love of the music and the airplanes and the vehicles to newer generations. And this music, I think, speaks to everyone. So we've got a young girl up there who knows all the words to All I Do Is Dream Of You. We've got some little kids bobbing their heads over here. And we've got a gentleman in the back rocking to these songs because these are the standards. These are the American classic songs. And um, I am so happy to have the opportunity with Air to Air TV um, to be able to bring these not just to the live audience, but to everybody that's watching online. And in a minute, I'll tell you about how you can watch content all year long uh, online if that's kind of your thing. But I want to sing because I've only got 10 minutes left. And um, this next song is a love song that was recorded by Joan Stafford. And um, when I first started doing this, I really only knew, you know, the Ella Fitzgerald and the easy ones. But as I started researching the music, I found Joan Stafford. And I think that her voice is just so wonderful and beautiful. And of all the songs she sang, this one is my favorite. Um, it's called You Belong to Me. And this one goes to Elaine. See the pyramids along the Nile. Watch the sun rise from a tropic isle. Just remember darling all the while you belong to me see the marketplace in old Algiers send me photographs and souvenirs just remember when a dream appears you belong to me I'll be so alone without you maybe you'll be in a silver plane see the jungle when it's wet with rain just remember till you're home again you so much. Oh, 
Okay, so just one quick little thing. I do want to really give a big thanks to airtoairtv.com. It is through their support that these kind of programs can not just be brought to you sitting out here, but also to everyone that is watching online. And, and I've seen some of their algorithms, and there are people watching from literally all over the world. But here's the thing. The, the coverage doesn't end at the end of, of, of uh, Air, Air Venture. You can actually enjoy content year round. Um, and here's the secret. Nobody else knows this except the ones that are watching and the ones that are here. If you go online this week and sign up, um, you can get a full free year of content. And that shows about airplanes, about um, the people who flew them, the people who build them, the places where you can see them. Just so much content that you could be entertained for the entire year. And you need this code, WARBIRDS22 to be able to access that content year round. So um, if you think it's something you would like, I'd encourage you to do it. And if they have any, if there's any way for you to place a review, just say, hey, Teresa sent you. Um, but I've got one more song for you because we're getting a little bit short on time. And I'm a much better singer than a talker. And so this is one I think so many people will recognize. And it is the one that everybody asks for even though I think everyone is tired of it. Um, and I like this one because it's a great dancing song, and I firmly believe that if we had to dance with each other, we'd all get along a whole heck of a lot better. Um, and so I'm always encouraging the singing and playing of songs that people can dance to. This is an Andrew Sisters tune that usually brings out the dancer and everyone. This is Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy. He was a famous trumpet man from out Chicago way. He had a boogie style that no one else could play. He was the top man at his craft. But then his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, he's blowing reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. They made him blow a bugle for his Uncle Sam. It really brought him down because he could not jam. The captain seemed to understand. And so the next day the cat went out and drafted a band And now the company jumps when he plays Reveille He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B A root, a toot, a tootly add and toot He blows eight to the bar In boogie rhythm he can't blow a note Unless the bass and guitar play with him And the company jumps when he plays Reveille He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B yeah. He was some boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B and when he plays Boogie Woogie Bugle, he's busy as a busy bee. And when he played, he made the company jump eight to the bar. He's a Boogie Woogie Bugle boy of Company B. And at a tootly, at a tootly, at a root toot, he blows eight to the bar. In Boogie Rhythm, he can't blow a note unless the bass and guitar play with him. And the company jumps when he plays Reveille. He's a Boogie Woogie Bugle boy of Company B. Yeah. Thank you so very much. OK, I have to do one more song for you. I'm going to do something less exciting. What? No, not that one. Uh, normally, I don't stop my thing. OK, so let me see. What am I going to sing? How about a great song that was originally um, uh, 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 recorded by the Glenn Miller Orchestra, and it was later recorded by my favorite singer from the 50s, uh, Etta James, this is the quintessential love song. Gentlemen, if you got a lady with you, hold her hand. She'll like it, I promise. This is At Last.
in clover Thank you. I saw you two up there being all snuggly. People think I can't see things, but I can. Uh, I want to thank everyone so much for sitting through the music portion as well as the reenactor portion, because I know several of you are here to hear all about the airplanes. But I am grateful that you have chosen Warbirds in Review as a place to spend part of your day. We do have uh, two more days of great programming, so if you're interested and you come back about 9.30, you'll get to see all of this all over again just in a diff with a different plane and oftentimes different music. So hopefully I'll get to see you again. If not, have a great day here at AirVenture and safe travels home. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Teresa. Folks, another warm round of applause for Teresa Eamon and our reenactors from the Living History Group for their pre-show entertainment today. And good afternoon. On behalf of Connie Bolin, our Warbirds in Review founder, con con coordinator, and executive producer, and the EAA Warbirds of America, we welcome you to Warbirds in Review. This is our 21st year of displaying significant historical aircraft alongside the people who own, maintain, and fly them. Starting from humble beginnings and the presentations have developed into world-class productions for you here in the audience and for people around the world to enjoy. And we thank you to those who provide the aircraft and the dedicated volunteers who assist to make this possible. Thank you to Ron and Diane Fagan and the Fagan Fighters World War II Museum in Granite Falls, Minnesota for the beautiful building that you see in front of you that makes this level of productions possible. And a special thank you to Jim Hagedorn and the Scott's miracle Grow Company for their long-lasting and continued support. Our mission is to recognize and honor the veterans who serve their country. As we entertain and educate, we continue to record history, heritage, and heroes in their own words. Thank you for being here to be a part of the program produced by Scott Guyette and the talented Sleeping Dog Productions team. Live streaming is provided through airtotairtv.com. Now, if you would, please direct your attention to the Jumbotron for the video introduction to this program.
Few aircraft are as well known or were so widely used for as long as the iconic C-47 Skytrain. Nicknamed Goonie Bird, the aircraft was adapted from the DC-3 commercial airliner, which first appeared in 1936. The first C-47s were ordered by the military in 1940. They carried personnel and cargo, and in a combat role, towed troop-carrying gliders and dropped paratroops into enemy territory. The C-47 Skytrain military transport aircraft played a major role in World War II in at least three theaters and proved beneficial to military operations around the world in roles that varied from limited to indispensable. General Dwight D. Eisenhower said, four things won the Second World War, the bazooka, the jeep, the atom bomb, and the C-47 Goonie Bird. By war's end, some 13,000 C-47 variants had been delivered, plus 2,000 more that were built under license by foreign manufacturers. Today's C-47A Skytrain from the Liberty Foundation accurately represents C-47A 43-15137, Chalk 40 which flew with the 306th Troop Carrier Squadron 7H, 442nd Troop Carrier Group. But before it came to the Liberty Foundation, it had played its own important role in World War II. Built in 1943 in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, it began service with the U.S. Navy, transferred to the U.S. Army Air Force, and was then finally leased to the Royal Air Force and sent to England. The aircraft served with distinction in combat, towing a glider on D-Day and participating in many named offenses, including Operation Market Garden. Please welcome Liberty Foundation founder and aircraft owner, Don Brooks. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to 2022 Warbirds in Review. This is Don Brooks. This is Ray Fowler. He's one of the pilots. And we also have John over here. You're one of the pilots also, right, John? Yeah. And over here is Pat Epps. And he is the backbone, I guess you would say, of the Lost Squadron Greenland Expedition. We'll be talking to him in a little bit. Have a seat, folks. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about, I don't know, John, maybe you could tell us this about the history of the DC-3 C-47, about its initial, uh, what, 1935, 1936? Yeah, December 17th, 1935, the first commercial DC-3 started service. And then, of course, by the start of the war, they needed to adapt an airplane to be able to for military service and it turned out to be the perfect airplane got modified to be a c-47 which had some higher gross weights cargo doors uh different engines uh, the pratt whitney engines on them made them a, a fantastic airplane and as evidenced by the fact that they're still flying now well that now they manufactured them up to when the end of the war Yes, it was just after the end of the war. I think uh, 44 is actually when they made the last C-47. I believe it was. All right, now this particular airplane, when was it built? Um, so the, the difference is whether you're talking Chalk 40 or this airplane. So this I'll particular Don, airplane, this airplane. All right, I'll let, I'll let Don answer to that. Okay, this airplane came out of the Oklahoma City plant in January of uh, 1944, and uh, it uh, made it over to... Uh, the UK in time to take part in uh, the Normandy invasion of June the 6th, 44, and uh, and a lot of other operations during the war. So, you want to expand on that? Or? Well, no, yeah, that's, that's fine. What, that, now, you, this, this airplane, since you've had it, has had three different paint jobs, right? 
Yes. One from the Greenland Expedition and the other one. Now, tell us about when you made your trip over for 19, 1994. Okay, yeah. When we first bought this airplane, I bought it in 1988, uh, and it was hauling freight. It was red and silver. Basler actually rebuilt the airframe in uh, 1986, so it was in excellent, sh excellent shape. Uh, we needed a uh, transport category aircraft to use to go to Greenland. Uh, so we uh, bought this. I bought it in 1988. We put snow skis on it and uh, flew it to Greenland for the big three big expeditions in 1989, 1990, and 1992 when we brought the P-38 Glacier Girl back. Okay, they, the, the paint job in 94, that was British. Is that correct? Yes, the first paint job uh, was, was British. It had the roundels. It was based out of England. And uh, the, the Brits used it uh, until the initial uh, uh, glider tug into the market garden. You know, then they transferred it to the RCAF, and it flew the uh, rest of the war with the RCAF. Uh, it did uh, seven resupply drops over Arnhem, and they said each time they went back, they had more German anti-aircraft anti and guns, and... Uh, this one was actually hit on its uh, seventh resupply drop, low level. It was hit in the left wing by any aircraft fire, and uh, it made it back to its base in England, and uh, they repaired it, and it went on to take part in Operation Market Garden, which was the largest airborne operation of World War II. It was, uh, you know, that was across another Rhine into Germany. Well, how about your, your trip over in 94, bit back, and then... St. Mary Glees, could you get into that, please? Um, yes. Well, I'm glad the trip to. over particularly. Yeah, the trip, uh, we, had, uh, we had used the airplane for three years to go to Greenland, and we had a group of American paratroopers that actually took part in World War II in the Normandy invasion uh, that wanted us to paint the airplane, uh, you know, in its combat markings and fly it back over there in 94 for the 50th anniversary of D-Day. And, uh, you know, we didn't start out with that intention, but they, find, they told us they had found uh, two planes in, in France that they could use that were C-47s. Uh, they called about uh, six months before uh, D-Day, plus 50, and uh, said that they had uh, these planes were involved in a bankruptcy. They couldn't get them, so they were in trouble. They didn't have anything to jump out of. So we put a rush paint job on the airplane you know, it was red and silver when we were taking it to Greenland, uh, high visibility colors. Uh, we, we put a rush paint job on it and painted it in uh, olive drab and its military markings, had the British roundels, uh, and flew it back over uh, in, in May of uh, 1994 for the 50th anniversary. Uh, had 20 sec 26 actual D-Day paratroopers that jumped again uh, over St. Mary Gleish, you know, 50 years to the day after they had jumped, and uh, they did great. It was uh, it was a good day. Uh, Pat Epps, who you know, Pat Epps was the leader and the organizer of the Greenland expedition, and uh, so Pat's got a lot of time in this airplane. But uh, Pat was a guy that really managed to make it possible for us to get to, to Normandy on D-Day plus 50, uh, and it was a windy day. They had the parameters set for the jump over St. Mary Gleish, and they said that uh, if the wind was more than 14 knots, that they would cancel the jump. And all day long, the, the winds had been too high. Uh, we took off from uh, La Havre, France, with our 26 paratroopers on board. Pat was pilot in command. You know, he kept getting a, uh, a check, wind check from the jump site and it was always, the winds were too high. And we had a whole uh, aviation brigade out of the UK, American paratroopers on C-130s. Uh, they were a lot of C-130s headed across the channel. They were listening too. So uh, when we were a few miles away from the jump, uh, we, Pat checked the wind, wind check again. It was too high. So all of these C-130s turned, turned back to England and uh, as we got closer, 
Fat checked one more time, and miraculously, the wind was like one knot lower than the max, you know, because these paratroopers had told us if, if we didn't, uh, if they couldn't jump, they were going to go out anyway. So uh, <laughs> they were a determined group. You know, they were great. Uh, the youngest one, the youngest one was uh, 68 years old. He was, he was uh, 18 on the day he jumped into Normandy, and the oldest was like 84. He was a full colonel. Uh, and and uh, so anyway, these, these were a great group of guys. But uh, you know, so we we dropped our guys, and when the American C-130s heard these guys were jumping, they scrambled. They had to turn around and head back to the jump site. And it was windy. It was really bad. Probably like the original Normandy, but it scattered those guys all over the place. They did have three injuries. Nothing more serious than a broken leg, but uh, uh, but they got their jump in too. So uh, we had a great time. One of our jumpers went out the door and uh, managed to get his parachute shroud or his lines tangled up. And uh, so we were worried about him, but he had the presence of mind to get his primary chute off. He deployed his, his reserve and uh, he hit the ground a little hard. So uh, the medics picked him up. They were taking him off on a stretcher to check him out. And uh, so we hurried back to La Harve, and we went in the lounge there, and we watched watched the replay on on TV, you know, the news. And they were asking him, "Are you all right, sir?" And he was slinging his arm around. I'm fine. I'd be doing better if they'd give me a beer. So, uh, but uh, those were great guys. We we took off from La Harve, and and we left the jump door on the ground. We had so many people in the plane, and and when we went to full power on takeoff. Uh, you could hear a roar from those guys, you know, that jumped 50 years before. Uh, and I told Pat, I said, Pat, that's the spirit that won World War II. Uh, you could hear it over 24 horsepower, 2,400 horsepower, these engines turning, you know, at full power. So, but uh, it's a great, great experience. Well, Don, to, to backtrack a little bit, let's get back to talk about the Greenland expedition and the Lost Squadron between you and Pat. Then you could okay. Pat, whatever you care for. Okay. And, and Pat, anytime you want to, you can join in. They was asking about the Greenland expedition. Uh, I know Pat went to Greenland five or six times uh, looking for the, uh, for the group. And for those that don't know, uh, there were six, six P-38 twin-engine fighters and two B-17 heavy bombers that were on their way to England uh, in 1942. Uh, the first, it, it was called Operation Bolero. It was the first mass movement of American warplanes and crews to the UK to help help the Brits over there. So uh, <clears throat> the first plane to go across, the first group to go across was uh, four P-38s and a, and a B-17. And, and it's funny that the first one across was piloted by Paul Tibbetts. And uh, of course, he's the guy that eventually organized the B-29 raids and dropped the first atomic bomb. But uh, the second and third groups got together uh, because of weather. So the second and third B-17s and, uh, and six of the P-38s started across uh, and coming out of uh, Greenland, they were headed to Reykjavik, Iceland. They got there and there was a sea fog, so they, they couldn't land. They turned around and headed back to the base in Greenland. They were blown off course to the south, and they didn't have enough fuel to make the base. Uh, so they elected to land as a group on the ice cap so they wouldn't be scattered out over hundreds of square miles. Uh, so anyway, they landed. You know, nobody was hurt. The brand-new airplanes were left behind. The guys were rescued a few days later. So uh, anyway, uh, Pat went up four or five times to try to locate them. He finally found them in 1988 using subsurface radar. Uh, and then that's when I got involved. I read about it, and I provided this DC-3 with skis so we could go back with a bigger group in 89, 90, and 92. And uh, that, it, that was just, it was an adventure of a lifetime. Uh, in, 80, in 89, we bored down to one of the B-17s, and we used a, uh, a hole saw to bring up a small piece of airplane skin. And there was 270 feet below the surface. 
and uh, that that gained us a uh, an extension on the salvage rights from the Danish government, and uh, and we tested a machine that I I developed and we took up that year. We tested a, a meltdown machine that could actually go into the ice, and uh, we didn't have but a few days to try it. But we found out the principle worked, and there were a couple of things we changed. So anyway, we went back in 1990. How big was the machine? Uh, the, the, the production machine was like four feet in diameter. And it, w it could melt, melt a hole straight down till we hit, hit the airplane. Uh, then we would use the hot water that we were sending down to the meltdown machine, which we called a gopher, and blast a cave around the airplane. So uh, you go down on a cable, uh, 270 feet, you know, and then you got this airplane at the rear of it still covered in ice. Uh, you're in a cave. <coughs> and uh, we brought back parts to the B-17 that was crushed badly. <coughs> and uh, then we, thinking that maybe we wouldn't go back, but we had found the airplanes. We had figured out how to get down to them, and they were, they were crushed almost beyond repair. So, uh, but we, we were talking about it, and, uh, and Pat decided, you know, in 1992, we need to go back and get one of the P-38s. So we did that, and I uh, brought the, the P-38 back to, uh, actually, we le left the ASCAP and brought most of the P-38 back in this airplane. Uh, the two engines, the outer wing panels, the, the gun nose, uh, most of the tail surfaces, everything but the center section, the biggest part, <coughs> wouldn't fit in there. So we brought that back one night and Pat was flying we landed. We landed out here and uh, it was late at night and he taxied down to where they put the Warbirds on the, the big line down there and Warbird Center. And uh, you know, we had a, one of the campers saw us coming in and of course the snow skis have skid plates on the back to keep them from wearing. You land on pavement, those skid plates shoot sparks back, you know, 20 or 30 feet. And a uh, guy w saw us come in, he woke up, you know, and of course those engines at night, you see the f blue fire lapping out of the exhaust too. <laughs> but uh, the guy ran all the way across the airport, met us when we shut it down, and he just was out of breath, but he won't let us know that the airplane he thought might be on fire. You know, he saw all of that. So anyway, we appreciated the thought, but uh, we weren't on fire. So we uh, displayed the, air, the airplane parts and the plane the next day here at Oshkosh. Had tens of thousands of people come by to see it. And I can remember uh, uh, Pat was telling them about it, you know, and, and uh, he'd tell them, he said, okay, he said feel, that, feel that part. He said, it's still cold. It came out of <laughs> 270 feet below the surface. But... Uh, the, the day before, we had been on the ice cap, and then we made it here. So, uh, well, what was your interest in uh, in going to Greenland to, to start off with? Understand that you were interested in the B seventeen, <clears throat> and for what reason? Yeah, the B seventeen. You know, I grew up. I came along shortly after the war, and uh, at a time when all the kids in school say, "What did your father do during the war?" You know, and uh, of course, mine was a tail gunner on a B seventeen. So. I was, uh, you know, my father encouraged me to fly. I learned to fly, you know, fairly early and <clears throat> never got into warbirds much until I read about Pat finding these in Greenland and uh, called him and got involved. And he was uh, good enough to let me get involved in it. But uh, I really wanted to try to find a B-17 I could recover, rebuild, you know, and fly it around the country so people could have a chance to see it and learn about it the great sacrifice of our veterans. Now, the, the, the particular air, the B-17, that uh, was the was the pilot still alive at that time? The, the, the parts that you recovered? <coughs> no, the pilot was not not uh, alive when we went to uh, went up and brought those parts back. Fifty years after he had landed there, <coughs> uh, we did meet the pilot's wife, uh, Pat. Uh, gave her uh, the, the B-17, uh, he had uh, Phyllis Arlene painted on it, and uh, we brought that back, and uh, Pat presented that to his wife on NBC Morning News with Deborah Norville, 
oh, in Atlanta right. at PDK. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway. that, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. So I was just going to say that, uh, you know, Pat was absolutely the leader of the Greenland expedition. He put it together. He made it happen. Uh, he was also the, the sole reason we were able to make that jump 50 years after D-Day, you know, but, uh, uh, Pat, if you have any comments you'd like to make about the Greenland expedition yeah. or our trip to Don Don Brooks came up with the idea for what I call a gopher. It was like a kid's spinning top, but he called me up from Douglas, Georgia, where he lived, and said <coughs> that the uh, he's got the solution. How are we going to get down to the airplane? And it was about four foot high, and he had copper tubing wrapped around the nose of this uh, cone shape. Uh, we called it the gopher, and we could run hot water through it. It would melt a hole, and that's what we used to get down to the airplane, drilled 250 feet to get to through the Greenland ice cap. And then once you got a good hole or tunnel to drop down then, anyway, Don came up with that idea on how to drill a hole in the Greenland ice cap. And uh, I don't know whether he made two or three of them, but at least he had one at work. And he called me from Douglas, Georgia, says, come look what I built. And I went down there, and he run the hot water through the copper coil, and he had 10 blocks of ice from the ice plant in Douglas, and he showed me how to drill a hole through the ice cap. And so we knew we had a way to get to the airplane now. So Mr. Brooks come up with that idea and built the gopher, the device, we used to drill a hole. And he's and got go the path. 250 <laughs> feet down. Uh, well, how about you mentioned earlier about bringing the machine guns out of the for the P-38? <clears throat> yeah, we uh, well the, the first machine guns we bought back were in '90 out of the uh, B-17 top right. turret. We brought that back as a souvenir. We turned the guns in at Burlington, Vermont Customs. It took about two years to get permission to get them. We had to uh, disassemble the machine guns, cut the right-hand side plates into three pieces, and then technically we were importing gun parts instead of guns. You can't import guns, you know. So anyway, we, we put them back together with uh, dummy side plates, so we have the guns back in the turret on display now, <clears throat> but uh, they, don't, they don't shoot. Did, we, it, did they shoot when you first got them out? We shot one of the P, one of the B-17 machine guns. We fired it on the cap with the original ammunition from 1942. And, of course, when we brought the P-38 up in 92, we fired the 20-millimeter uh, cannon with the original high-explosive incendiary ammunition. So it still worked. Oh. <laughs> well, tell us about, the, about your problem with the engine on takeoff. <clears throat> Somebody had brought up <clears throat> when the last year we were in Greenland and with the DC-3 in 1992. <clears throat> we had an engine that on the right side that uh, was we knew was short-lived, and it's a it's a big problem to try to change a DC-3 engine on the ice cap. But first you got to get it out there, and that's a massive job for an 18 get an 1830 engine out there, and then to try to change it, you need some equipment. <clears throat> so uh, Pat again was our leader, and uh, uh, you know Pat made the decision that we really need to get this airplane back to Kulasuk, where we have forklift and we can change the change the engine more easily. Uh, and he said, you know, I think uh, I think that it, maybe we can limp back to Kulasuk with it. <clears throat> In reality, he knew that the engine wasn't going to last long. Uh, but uh, he got it. He got it in the air. He took off. Uh, you know, warmed the left engine up. The right engine uh, didn't have a lot of time, so he started it and pretty much took off right away. 
and uh, both of them were producing power, got it into the air, and about that time the right engine came apart, and uh, it looked like a, a flare on that right side. It blew the cowling up into the prop. Uh, he climbed a little more, got some altitude, and uh, turned, headed back to Kulasuk, and of course where we're on the cap, it's about 2,000 feet above sea level. Kulasuk's just a little above sea level, so 100 miles, so they shut down the right engine, you know, still feathered the prop, and the plane flew fine. He, he flew it back to uh, Kulasuk, landed. We had another engine shipped up, got it about there two months later, and uh, we changed it, and Pat flew the thing back to back to Georgia. So, uh, Pat, don't, you want to comment on that? Uh, Tell them about, uh, the, about the betting, about whether you were going to make it or not. Uh, See. I had a guy out of Denmark in the right seat, and uh, he somebody said something about on the ground, said, your right engine's on fire. So I just asked the co-pilot, I says, what do you, th would you look out there and see if it's, he says, yes. Oh, okay. So we just shut the mixture off, cut the gas to it, and fly for an hour, as Don said, the 100 miles back to Kulasuk, and uh, they will fly on one engine. <laughs> so you just do what you got to do and do it. Tell us about the, about the betting on that, about, about, about betting on whether you're going to uh, make it or not. Yeah. You know, the Kulasuk Airport is maintained mostly by Danish workers, and at that time anyway, and uh, – they have to keep the airport open all year, and, and during the winter, they get a tremendous amount of snow. So anything, they have one ramp that they keep clear, they scrape it. You know, you can go over there in the winter, and the, and the runway is down in a hole that's probably 8 or 10 feet deep, you know, and they scrape it, keep scraping it and blowing the snow away, and they clear this one ramp where planes can come in, turn around, and unload and go back out. Uh, so anyway, our, our DC-3 was sitting there with a broken engine after we made it back from the ice cap. And we had to ship an engine up. That was going to take probably 60 days to get it there. So we all went home and had the engine shipped. <clears throat> and then when it, uh, the, those guys make pretty good money at that airport, but they don't have much to do for entertainment. So uh, they, they started betting that we wouldn't come back in time to save the airplane if we didn't get back before the big snow, they were going to push it down in the dump and just push it off the end of the runway into the dump. And there was another DC-3 down there that was pushed in because it had a bad mag, and they didn't get it changed in time. But uh, So anyway, the, we didn't know it, but they were betting big money that we wouldn't come back. And the guys that knew us best, like the airport manager, a guy named Torben Dahl, a few other people, they bet we would. But we didn't know it. So anyway, we, the day we showed up, uh, Bob Harless and I got there first on commercial out of Reykjavik, Iceland. And uh, the door opened, and I've never seen all these guys on the runway so glad to see us. I didn't know what, why, you know, but it's because we came back to get that airplane. And then uh, we started changing the engine, and they gave us all the help we could possibly want, equipment, anything we needed. <clears throat> and then uh, Pat showed up two or three days later. You know, he was going to fly it back for us, and uh, we had it about ready, and then we worked late that night. It was awesome. The weather was pretty, and most unbelievable northern lights you've ever seen over the mountain there at uh, Kulasuk. <coughs> but anyway, <coughs> we fired it up, you know, late and taxied down to the active ramp, you know, which meant we were going to leave. And uh, they had a dinner for us that night at the mess hall, you know, big party, and of course, they believe if you open, take the the top off a bottle, it has to stay there until it's gone, you know. So, anyway, we didn't participate in that, but they had a big time. And uh, so, anyway, they, they the first bet was we wouldn't come back to get it. Well, they won that one because we did come back to get it. Then they started another bet that said it wouldn't ever fly away from that airport. So, uh, 
we won that one too, you know. We did, took off and came and pat, did a low pass right down the ramp, you know, and we could see these guys out there handing money back to them. We didn't know what that was <laughs> all about, you know. And then, again, they made the next bet, well, that thing will not make it all the way to Atlanta, Georgia. So our same guys bet on us again. And when we landed at Peachtree DeKalb Airport, Epps Aviation, as soon as we shut the engine down and opened the door, one of Pat's people came out and said, Pat, there's a guy from uh, airport manager from Coolasook, Greenland, wants to talk to you. Okay, so Pat went in. He said, yeah, we got here. We're doing good. Torben said, okay, thank you. And, and Torben and his guys won so much money from that bet about this airplane that uh, he, he put in a cable TV service at Coolasook and ran it across to where the village was, so he, he did pretty well from that uh, series of bits. Pat, you have any more comments? No, it's Mr. Brooks. Of course, he had the DC-3, and I just conned him out of, we need to go up to Greenland, and if you haven't seen Greenland, you need to go to Greenland, Don. And I <laughs> sold him. It. I, I, I got a gold star for my airplane's salesmanship that day. <laughs> Pat did I great. I didn't con Don into it. It didn't take a whole lot of convincing to get him to participate from South Georgia yeah. down there and 250 miles below Atlanta. <laughs> and my, my brother Ben had been a flight instructor there in 42, and that's when Don and his folks were down there. And uh, Douglas, Georgia was a primary flight school for the military, World War II. And Don has now got him a museum down there in a Quonset hut like this over here. And uh, tell us a little bit, you got anything there now? You got some P-38 guns there. Oh yeah, yeah, we have, uh, well we got the top turret from the B-17. Uh, we may talk about it later. We're rebuilding a B-17 there that we hope to fly in two and a half or three years and uh, so we stay pretty busy but we do have a uh, do have a museum there dedicated to 10,000 pilots that learned to fly there during World War II and uh, you know we had some that turned out pretty good Charles Loring learned to fly there and they, he earned the Medal of Honor in Korea they named Loring Air Force Base after him uh, a guy named Rosie Rosenthal, yeah. most decorated bomber 100. pilot of World War II, learned to fly there in our little town of Douglas. And, the bloody 100th. Yeah, and they're doing a doing a movie on it now that's going to be unbelievable. It'll air sometime in early 2023, and it'll be about the Eighth Air Force out of England. So uh, it's it's uh, they had done the Band of Brothers and the War in the Pacific, so they're doing a new one now. But can't wait to see yeah. it come out. Ray, this is Ray Fowler, by the way. I didn't introduce Ray properly. I met Ray when he was, what, 18 years old or something? He knocked on my, the wrong door Just my house. Ray is a lieutenant colonel in the Air, Alabama Air National Guard F-16 pilot. He's flown five combat tours. He's a real hero. Afghan, Iraq, Syria. His warbird qualifications include, not all of them, but P-51, P-82, P-40, P-47, Corsair, ME-109, B-25, B-17, P-38, and the Beaver and the T-6 and probably some others that I don't know about. Now, Ray, pick us up from the, actually from this paint job, explain this paint job and what you guys are trying to do with all of your, uh, what, what, all, all, all of the d demonstration stuff that you have here. Thanks, Sam. And so I'll take it back even a little further. So uh, growing up in Georgia and uh, starting as a young flight instructor, uh, I had uh, heard about the Greenland Expedition, obviously, and uh, had the opportunity very early in my career to meet uh, Mr. Epps. Uh, actually, uh, my first warbird I got to fly was based at Epps Aviation at Peace Treaty Cab Airport. So I'd get to see him come in and out with the DC-3, and just like anybody else in all these airplanes, uh, and I'm still uh, the biggest kid here. You know, I just drooled over uh, the possibility of actually getting to ride in one, much less getting to fly one. Uh, I'd also heard of uh, Don Brooks, and uh, as uh, 
and, and I can't say enough. I mean, both these guys are, are uh, you know, uh, Hall of Georgia Aviation Hall of Fame, what they've done. If you haven't read that expedition, uh, it, it fascinated me before I ever even had an opportunity to talk to them in person. So uh, I kind of sit back, uh, you know, in this environment, you get to meet people uh, that you read about in books. And, uh, and again, uh, they, they do not disappoint. Um, but to this airplane itself, uh, I had the opportunity once uh, I met Don, I came down and did his air show in Douglas, and uh, he had a phenomenal air show. Uh, Douglas is almost into Florida, so uh, I still live in Atlanta, just to the west. Douglas is, uh, you know, the, the further you go south, the, uh, the more you get away from where I live in Atlanta. So Douglas is still, uh, you know, I would say a small town and uh, almost to Florida and went down and much in the middle of nowhere, he had a phenomenal air show, and I got to be uh, good friends with him into Liberty Foundation. So at the time, his uh, three, after the they used it for the uh, expedition and went and did his 50th anniversary in D-Day, uh, I think pretty much the airplane, uh, you guys kept proficiency in it and flew it around, and and uh, some other people that are still very involved with Liberty, Joey Hand, he flew up here with you as well. And uh, so I think you just flew the airplane to go to some events and shows, right? And it really didn't have... Uh, uh, a lot of purpose outside of what uh, Don has built and continues to build uh, for the Liberty Foundation, which we'll talk about a little later. So, so his airplane was there. It was uh, uh, since he went back to the D-Day squadron markings. You know, they painted the airplane, and it was getting fairly weathered. Uh, the airplane uh, was starting to look a little ratty. Um, I fly for Delta Airlines. Of course, Sam flew for Delta Airlines forever as well. And uh, Delta uh, always puts on, uh, they're very veteran friendly. They love having a great event. And they bring in modern military, every airplane they can get. And so they said, man, we would love to have the C-47 in. And we, we also brought our B-17 in for them, B-25, some other airplanes. Well, I think they took pity on us for our paint because the paint was literally coming and chipping off, and which, which worked out really well. So uh, they approached us at the time and said, you know, we, we really would like to talk to you about sponsoring a paint job on your airplane. So uh, I guess it's good to show up with an airplane that has paint falling off of it uh, when you show up. Um, so in conjunction with uh, Delta Airlines, uh, we end up taking the airplane to uh, Lake Charles, Louisiana to Landlock Aviation. Uh, and though it's just been an amazing process of the paint that we we're coming in. But let me back up just a little bit. They, uh, we wanted to look at how are we gonna paint the airplane. So at one point, uh, Don had uh, a group approach him and the airplane was uh, halfway repainted as the Jungle Strippers, or Skippers, excuse me, Jungle Skippers, Freudian slip. So that's what we called it. Uh, it's the uh, the Jungle Skippers, uh, which um, again was a very unique paint uh, job uh, itself, but without the invasion stripes. And we wanted to go back to a U.S. paint job, even though this airplane, uh, as a Lend-Lease airplane, went to the RAF. And like Don said, actually this actual airplane flew on D-Day. It towed a glider on D-Day, Market Garden name, but. Uh, we have several uh, jump teams, uh, one being the Liberty Jump Team, not associated with the Liberty Foundation, but Liberty Jump Team, the Air Demonstration Team. A lot of the uh, people that actively jump out of airplanes, I don't know why you'd want to do that, but they want to jump out of a U.S. airplane. So we started looking for a new, uh, you know, what would be something we could honor uh, that this group of uh, people that has done so much for our freedoms. Uh, I came across a beautiful painting uh, that's on uh, just searching the internet to try to do something that had not been done before. Uh, artist's name is Ron Cole. I tried to call him several times just to get the background on that airplane. And once I got with Ron, once I got with Ron on the phone, he uh, gave me the backstory about a gentleman uh, which was actually going to be here at Oshkosh uh, to, to talk about the airplane. Uh, Van Velkenberg, he's with Questmasters. He commissioned the print, and he actually did, uh, you know, wrote an amazing 600-plus page documentary that he has on the 306 uh, Troop Carrier Squadron uh, and this actual paint job, which we call Chalk 40. So uh, as you guys know, in, or may or may not know, in World War II, uh, when people would walk out to the airplanes uh, in the chalk that they would jump with, and it was at 26 jumpers, or how many people jumped in World War II? You remember, Don? How many, was, how many did you have jump uh, out of the Make back? Make up some. We had 26. Yeah. yeah, so I think it was like, uh, I've heard as many as 30, but uh, had would jump out of the airplane. But they would walk out in chalk, and they would really would literally write in chalk by the back door the chalk number so the jumpers would know which airplane to go climb on, obviously, when you have dozens, if not hundreds, of airplanes that they're loading on to go load into their chalk. So if you look, it's part of the graphic on the back door of this airplane. We actually have the 40. You may not be able to see it from your seat there, but we actually have the graphic from the 40, which 
would depict this airplane literally on June 6, 1944, uh, as the, um, the jumpers would uh, come out of the airplane. So once we looked in and, and I, I got to Van, and he was so helpful uh, with the history, he knows every person sat in every seat of this airplane, and obviously that was a mission specifically, which would Chalk 40 was just for that day. Uh, and we know the history of the, uh, the paint scheme for some other uh, name jumps uh, where we're different chalk numbers. But again, as you'll see, all the C-47s that fly, you know, people want to tell the story and the way we tell the story is through Chalk 40. Uh, so anyway, after I looked at the print and uh, we kind of talked about it and, and thought it was a really good looking uh, paint job, uh, I did ask them about the nose art and you'll see the, the, the cards and the four aces on the paint. And, uh, Ironically, this is uh, homework for anybody here that wants to help, uh, and I don't know that you'll get there, but uh, we, can, we have a, original pictures of the real airplane uh, before, and it was scrapped uh, at some point after the war, uh, but there was actually some nose art written above the, uh, the cards, and we can't tell what it says, so we're, we're going to add that when we find a family member that can tell us what that said as far as the aces go, but we, we do know the history on the airplane. Uh, ironically, Van actually has the original cockpit too, Chalk 40, that flew. He was able to run it down to records before it was scrapped and save the cockpit. But um, again, it, it just it enhances our mission for what we do to continue to do jumps. And in fact, next month we'll do a, a, a Benning jump and we'll have uh, active duty guys jump out at Fort Benning uh, next uh, month in August uh, on the, the 19th of August. And then we'll do another jump on the 20th of August. So that's how we support the mission. Um, uh, Delta, Landlock, uh, all the people that actually stepped up to paint the airplane. Uh, this will be really the third airplane they painted for us, and it's uh, it's just everybody comes together to keep these airplanes going, and we 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 hope to continue to do the same thing. Explain the significance of your cargo here. So that's another thing that the same gentleman that is so smart on everything to do with the markings and. Uh, you know, little things that you wouldn't think of as like the Pathfinder antennas that you see that were originally on this airplane, uh, very difficult to find. Uh, he is into every little detail to include, and I'm sorry to point, that's the, uh, what some people would say, what's that ugly antenna up on the front? Well, it is kind of hideous, but that was an original Pathfinder antenna that they would use uh, as part of their DF finding to, uh, to make sure they went to the right jump zone, which I'm sure was uh, not always an easy task to find out uh, where you're going to go jump. Uh, all of the items that you see here, we uh, actually, uh, he approaches as well, and this is what he does. All the, the markings, stenciling, the right kind of container, the size, uh, everything, just like they said in the video of what won the war. Um, you know, the C-47 really was the backbone for uh, not only hauling troops and, and sending people into combat, but hauling supplies and dropping supplies. This actual airplane, you know, I'm sure sent a lot of these supplies out of the airplane as a part of uh, Market Garden for resupplies. And so it's, it's kind of one of those things. We, we, we love the history, just like with, you know, watching all the, the people with the outfits and the military vehicles. And uh, again, it, this is just one small part, which outside of the C-47 we're going to talk about. And I know you'll get to it, Sam, a little bit about our B-17, B-25, well, some yeah, of the other we'll projects. Well, you we'll in a minute. But, but sure, that's... Uh, uh, so when you get a chance, come down and look at some of the things to include the, the mortar rounds. And uh, those, that's as exactly as it would look and how it would be loaded in the C-47 in World War II. Now, do you carry this guy around with you so he can sleep under the wing all the time? Yes, he goes everywhere we go. <laughs> well, well, tell us about your foundation. Now, this is a different story altogether, you and Don both. You want to start with that, Don, or...? Yeah, we started the Liberty Foundation uh, as a nonprofit educational foundation. Uh, we started it back in 2002 uh, when we actually bought uh, the B-17 Liberty Bell. It was under restoration down in Kissimmee at Tom Riley's uh, restoration facility. You know, we've, we've got it, had to finish the restoration. He did, did that for us. You know, we flew the airplane for the first time in, in late, 2004 I'm pretty sure and put it I started putting it on tour in 2005 and we've had tens of thousands of people literally that we've have flown in that airplane uh, you couldn't count how many went through on ground tours but uh, we've been all over the US uh, you know with it uh, uh, Ray and and I took it to uh, back to England in 2008 and Ray might talk about that some it was a great trip uh, we flew over, went to a lot of the big air shows. The people in the U.K. are unbelievable. They still appreciate and honor 
our veterans from World War II. It was uh, unbelievable to the people that would turn out at every stop that we made in the airplane uh, at uh, Prestwick, Scotland. We cleared custody. You know, we went in there initially. I mean, there were thousands of people. Uh, the, we saw the paparazzi firsthand. It was, you know, they'd fight to get to get an interview. Uh, went on to uh, uh, Duxford, checked in with those guys. They had the big biggest war show in Europe there every year. We were going to be part of that. Uh, went down into London for a little R&R, &R, stayed a few days and flew back out, you know. Uh, but everybody was super nice. We went to several museums that were ex-World War II control towers, you know, and the, and the people there still put flowers out for these veterans, you know, from 1944. And uh, it's just it's un unbelievable. Brought the airplane back. So uh, the foundation has done a lot. And, and I have to say that Ray Fowler has been the, the executive director ever since we started it, also the chief pilot. Uh, John Hess has flown countless hours for us, uh, does just a wonderful job, and, uh, and still helping us. Uh, it's, we got a new instrument panel, new interior, uh, all of the things that John's been behind pushing to get done. So, uh, you know, we just keep getting better. And we have some new things that I'll let Ray mention. Yeah. Ray, tell us about what your future plans are for the foundation. So uh, many of you guys, obviously, once we got involved with the, the B-17 Liberty Bell, if you guys saw an airplane that actually had an in-flight fire in 2011 and landed in the field, uh, that was our aircraft. So that was the Liberty Bell. Uh, Actually, John was in the left seat and actually had uh, did a spectacular job. I was in front of him with a different airplane um, uh, that had gone ahead for us to land in Indianapolis, but uh, he took off out of Aurora, Illinois, had an in-flight fire, did a phenomenal job, had the airplane on the ground in a minute and a half in a field, and uh, sadly, the fire trucks were not able to get to the airplane to put the fire out. Uh, however, most people, if you look at the end result of that, it was a total success in our minds. Nobody got hurt. We can rebuild airplanes. Uh, not that it's ideal to burn your airplane up and start over because Don's first B-17 took 14 years, 15 years. So, uh, so anyway, we pretty much started from scratch from that. But uh, John did an amazing uh, you know, ability to get the airplane into the field, and um, we started rebuilding that airplane pretty much uh, as soon as we got the, what was left of it back. So... Uh, we hope in three years, maybe, uh, four years, it's just a matter of uh, pouring enough uh, liquid dollars into the account to keep paying the bills, and uh, that's where really the public comes in for us. I mean, we we look to the donations to survive as a 501c3. Uh, the most exciting thing that happened to us here just recently is we had a full B-25 donated to us from another nonprofit. So it's a flying B-25, so we'll have that up for you to talk about next year. Uh, up here, it, uh, Delta painted that for us as well, Landlock, so it's getting a new paint job right now and, and going through some checks before we put it out on tour. Uh, but uh, museum closed on the West Coast, and uh, they were lucky, they were, I say we were lucky enough, but they were nice enough. Uh, they had known our story, and they had uh, safely operated that airplane for 50 years, and they uh, were the new custodians of the airplane to continue telling its story um, down, and we'll hopefully tour and give uh, public tours of that airplane for years to come. So. Uh, we're excited about it, and many people don't know where Liberty Bell is going to fly again. Um, but everything we, uh, every dollar we bring in, we put into the uh, foundation to keep the airplanes flying. You have any other comments you want to make before we open up to questions? Not much. I just say that you know it's been such a pleasure for me to be part of this. You know, uh, Pat kiddingly said he, he conned me out of the, you know, getting into the Greenland expedition. You know, I've said I think Pat countless times for letting me, part, me be part of that adventure. It's an unbelievable story. I mean, we can tell stories for days about it, but I've always said the, the best thing about getting involved in the Greenland expedition for me was to have the chance to build a friendship with Pat Epps, but a great aviator. Uh, you'll never find anybody better to work with or fly with than Pat, and of course, you know, same thing with the Liberty Foundation. Uh, Ray's been part of that since we started it, and folks like John Hiss, uh, you know, John doesn't talk about being the PIC when the B-17 burned up, but I remember the morning John called me and said, uh, you know, I have to give you this bad news, you know, the Liberty Bells has, we did an off-field landing and it's burned, and uh, 
and the first thing I did was thank him for doing such a great job, you know. And, and I asked him, don't, please don't ever second guess your decision to put it down there instead of trying to fly it to an airport. Uh, you know, he just did an unbelievable job. It couldn't have been better. If we'd have had one person killed or seriously hurt, I would have regretted ever getting involved with Warbirds at all. So, uh, you know, I have to thank John for an unbelievable job that he did that day. So, uh, but it's all the way through. We have a lot of our volunteers out here. And, uh, you know, it just means so much. And we do it to honor our veterans. So thanks to all of you that were part, you know, the people that defend, were there to defend our country. And, and we can never replay, pay the bill, never pay what we owe. So uh, thank you. Uh, Speaking of veterans, will all of our veterans stand up, please, and be recognized? Kyle, do you have anybody over there for a question? No. Nobody? How about this side over here? No questions? Surely there's a question. We did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> you, you guys can uh, come see it. We're going to hang around the airplane anyway, so come yeah. come talk to us. I know you guys uh, probably spent all your Wait money minute, to get here. Wait a minute. We got one over here. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was just wondering how the uh, airplane performs and what do you do to practice single engine work if you're training somebody? I know you wouldn't do it at pattern altitude, you'd get up at altitude, but how does it fly when you have to pull one all the way back and uh, practice on one? That, that, that is a great question. We actually, uh, just this year we got the FAA contract, so we maintain the FAA inspector's currency in this airplane, which will include us literally shutting down, feathering and unfeathering an engine. Uh, however, we just uh, replaced, uh, we've been running down uh, a leak on an oil cooler, uh, which we were going up to a jump last month and uh, uh, proceeded to send about 25 gallons of oil out of our right engine. Uh, so I, I shut it down. Uh, this airplane flies phenomenally on, on one engine. now. I wouldn't want to do it at, uh, when I'm full of gas or at different altitudes or, you know, but you think about when they flew with people, we were so light today. So it, the thing does fly really, really well on single engine. So just like talking about Pat flying the airplane to Kula Souk on one engine. Uh, it, it is a pleasure to fly on one engine. So yeah, it's a good thing it has a spare. Uh, again, it just depends on the, the environment of all these airplanes now. We're, we're very light. We use reduced fuel loads. We do really a lot to protect them. And it's worth talking about since really the discussions about the C-47 and the DC-3. They never really built an airplane that does what this airplane does. Right. I mean, so Basler well, you, and putting the turbine engines on it. Uh, this, this airplane's still working in Alaska. It's working overseas. It does humanitarian work. Uh, we get call. I think Don gets calls, and they're trying to buy his airplane because this is really one of the lower-time airframes that out and flies. Uh, and that's just because it does everything well, and it really does, from a volume standpoint, the, the downside on it, and, and we'll, we pay the price when we go home from Oshkosh, it burns 100 gallons an hour, and we're not a whole lot faster than a, than a Cessna 182, uh, you know, so we're about 135, 140 knots um, going home at 100 gallons an hour, and of course, at uh, 7 $8 a gallon, that does leave a mark, but uh, it, it, it's amazing. You, Ray, you might want to also mention that this is the first airplane that the airlines made any money with. Up to that point, they were always subsidized. But at this point, they can make money. And it's amazing. Just you get it. And every one of these airplanes, you know, have quite a story to tell when you get in to go fly them. But it is pretty iconic. And I know Don, you know, his story is when you're flying it in the weather and, and it, uh, it still leaks just as much today oh, yeah. as it did whenever it flew back in 1942. Terrible. So you're sitting there flying and you're trying to find a trash bag to put over your leg. Uh, to keep the water from leaking out on you. And that would have been, you know, that's what uh, they flew with before. Uh, so, it, again, it's, uh, it's a very unique experience. And if you have an opportunity, I mean, if I were to pick an airplane that's iconic, to, you know, to go take a flight in or take a training flight, and we do that some, sometimes for our training, for second-in-command training, just to go fly the DC-3. It is uh, so unique from uh, most other airplanes we fly. From a personal standpoint, I don't think, if you fly a lot of airplanes, this is going to be one of your favorites. It might not be your favorite, but it'll be up there. Yeah, it is. Right. You know the story, For anybody that uh, 
hasn't heard the story about it, they say when they retire the last 747 out in the desert, it'll be a DC-3 that picks up the crew to fly them back. And you know there's a lot less 747s out there already, yeah, so I think it's yeah. coming. Awesome. Yeah, we have one over here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you sparked a question in my mind when you start talking about the operating costs. Full up, what do you estimate your fully burdened operating costs are annually for this uh, effort? Wow. Well, if you were to put in the fixed cost of what it costs for insurance, I mean, everything's gone through the roof. It's so hard to put a number on it just because we fly the airplane so little. So when we were fully on tour before COVID with our B-17, we would fly the airplanes 200, 250 hours a year. So every every hour we flew, we were able to divide that out a little bit. And I think that is kind of the argument for putting the airplane on the road and keeping it on the road for the public. Um, but just again, you know, right now uh, at seven, eight dollars a gallon, you know, you're looking just eight hundred dollars an hour in operating cost. Um, I do think insurance is going to be a big issue, and of course, engines. You know, uh, you're talking a decade ago, you could overhaul these engines for forty thousand dollars. I think the last 1830 that I was talking to someone that had it overhauled was just shy of a hundred thousand dollars for an overhaul. So um, it's just everything like we're all paying today for everything really double or triple. So I'm hoping that reset comes. We all hope that happens since we all fly airplanes, I'm guessing here, if you're here at Oshkosh. Uh, but yeah, it's just hard to put a number on it. To go to our B-17, our insurance to for the airplane, uh, even post when we had our fire, um, we, we operated up until COVID with two other leased B-17s, um, that insurance alone was about $130,000 a year. So we flew it one hour, that'd be $130,000 just for the operating cost for the insurance. So um, it's it, it's a challenge, um, which kind of leads me into, if you guys haven't spent all your money, uh, come buy a t-shirt from us, um, You know, come over and talk to us. Uh, Fran, which is uh, John's wife is over there. She's responsible for all this stuff and we're gonna set up for that. and. Uh, I see your P-51 shirt. I just bought one of those. That uh, We flew Bud Anderson, by the way, uh, in the P-51s day before yesterday at 100 years old. So uh, we love it. If you want to leave with a Chalk 40 shirt, we'll uh, we'll take your money. Awesome. Anybody else? And it's going to rebuild the bill. One right here. Is there any uh, consideration for this plane going back for D-Day plus 80? What? Absolutely. Yeah, they. In fact, the uh, the jump teams have already approached us for that. So, again, we we uh, we do need to find kind of an angel sponsor for that. You know, in today's world, I will say when we went in 2008, we retraced retraced the original route uh, that Don had done before. So we went Goose Bay, Narsarsawak, Reklavik, Presswick into there. We I think we went at the second most expensive time in history uh, for fuel to do that, and it was 25 hours from the time we left. Bangor, Maine, to the time we touched down into Duxford uh, with a B-17. So uh, hopefully we'll find somebody. If you guys have any uh, rich relatives that uh, want to help us fund that, that is exactly what the Liberty Foundation is all about. I mean, we, we put every dollar we have to advancing aviation, and I can think of no better thing to be uh, over at the 80th for that jump. I know Don will support it because I've called with a whole lot, you know, more harebrained ideas that he's always said yes to. So uh, uh, we would look good uh, doing that on the 80th. We, we actually were scheduled to go for the 75th, and we just uh, weren't able to put it together, uh, which was an amazing uh, feat for all the airplanes. I think 16 total airplanes made that crossing, and uh, it's a very active group of people that keep the C-47s active and keep them in the public eye. Great question. Anyone else? <clears throat> Well, thanks, folks. We appreciate you coming and waiting on us this time. Thank you, Don. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Sam. you, Ray. Thank you, John. grass made to feel the joy of each and every blade between our toes across our backs to run over its hills marvel at its beauty and find comfort in its stillness we were made for grass it's where we battled and celebrated built monuments grew families forged memories and pushed ourselves farther than ever before 
We were made for grass, to care for, nurture, and cultivate. We've always made sure to have a patch of our own, because there's no greater feeling than being on the grass, except leaving it. join this organization and it's a constant learning process and and that's another thing that I love about it because a good pilot is always learning always Net a membership isn't just for pilots it's for everyone who loves aviation past present and future we have a lot of members that are not uh, they're not even pilots. They love the fact that uh, the, uh, the airplanes still fly and they share the enthusiasm and the pride that's going on. It's a place where history comes to life, where the future is sparked by imagination and where aviation is more than just wings in the air.
That's what it's all about at the end of the day. What else is it for? I was asked, you know, uh, where do I see NADA going into the future? And uh, I see uh, nowhere but up. Be a part of it. Join NADA today. It just climbs off all by itself. It just, it does it itself. 
Every time I open the hangar door to go flying, I realize that I'm one of the lucky guys doing something that I dreamt of as a kid. World War II changed the world forever, and forever after. The 
Fagan Fighters World War II Museum of Granite Falls, Minnesota was created as a tribute to the men and women of the greatest generation, whose incredible sacrifices during World War II won and preserved the freedoms we enjoy today. The Fagan Fighters World War II Museum is the dream, the creation, and the passion of the Fagan family of Granite Falls, Minnesota. Ron and Diane Fagan and their sons, Aaron and Evan. We've taken on a mission to connect the latest generation with the greatest generation because these are events in our history that need to be remembered. And in our case, and in the case of young children, they need to be introduced to. And we feel they're very important and need to be preserved, and that's what we're trying to do. The mission is to preserve the memory of the heroes of World War II, promote patriotism in today's Americans, and inspire tomorrow's leaders to study and apply history's lessons. It's not enough that these beautiful airplanes are collected and restored. The Fagan Museum restores each of them to flying condition. I think with everything at the museum, having stuff operational is important because people get to see them, how they were used, and get to hear them start up, and it gives people a better perspective of what these machines were capable of and what they look like in the air. There are no markers, monuments, or visitor centers in the skies above Europe, the Pacific, or the China-Burma-India theaters of World War II. These airplanes are the monuments. They are timeless portals to the courage and deeds of those who gave their all to preserve all that we hold dear. When the museum's airplanes are not flying, they are displayed in three hangars. The trainer hangar, the fighter hangar, and the bomber hangar. World War II was a worldwide conflict, and unfortunately it's not being taught in our schools anymore. But history always has a tendency to repeat itself, so we got to educate the younger generations about World War II. So learn these experiences from the past so you can apply them in the future to help guide this country in the right direction. I know the buildings are built to last 250 years. The stories that are contained within these buildings will last just as long. We're connecting some of the battles. The only thing we can connect them with are the ground machines, which many people have a connection to rather than the aircraft. With the museum opening, I started looking into the military vehicles. Started with the deuce and a half. Uh, the ambulance, um, that, when I had that repainted, we made sure that it matched the 4th Medical Battalion. And the 4th Medical uh, Battalion actually were the first ambulances to arrive on D-Day. The ground vehicles all operate. Uh, fully functional and uh, we could start them all up and take off and, and drive them right now. The Fagan Fighters World War II Museum doesn't just tell the story of what happened. It is dedicated to preserving the stories of those who lived it, telling us how it happened. Veterans and others are invited to the museum to share their stories firsthand. 
Their stories are recorded and preserved through the museum's Voices of Valor program. Let's do our museum around uh, my father, Ray Fagan, and his uh, World War II experiences. The first campaign medal he got was Normandy Invasion. Second campaign medal he got was Liberation of Paris. And the third campaign medal he got was uh, the Battle of the Bulge. He said, you never can't imagine how terrible it was. We decided to make our collection a real museum when people referred to it as such. We opened the museum doors directly after our air show in 2012, so the date was June 17, 2012. The Fagan Fighters World War II Museum puts its collection in context for visitors by using original murals, sculptures, paintings, photographic collections, and other fine art to tell the story of epic events such as D-Day, June 6, 1944. This rail car, which anchors the museum's Holocaust exhibit, was found after years of searching in Germany and brought here so that no generation will ever forget the horror of the Holocaust or the memories of those who were lost. When the Germans marched in, I was seven years old. And I was liberated in January 18, 1945. I was eight years old. And these are some of the things I remember. The best single teacher we have about the lessons of the Holocaust are survivors. And for years, they've been the most important teachers. Sadly, as the historian Deborah Lipstadt would say, the tyranny of biology means we have fewer and fewer survivors to speak. Memorials, and that's almost too static a term, uh, opportunities to learn, like this exhibit, which opens people's eyes to the horrors of the Holocaust, are becoming ever more important in the absence of survivors. So what the Fagans have done here with their exhibit is to create a wonderful, remarkable learning opportunity for people of southwestern Minnesota, entire state, upper Midwest, and I know people from coming from all over the world and learning about the Holocaust through this specific lens. So we thank the Fagans for their generosity of spirit, their vision, and their commitment to Holocaust education as they teach about the Second World War. We're very happy to call the JCRC friends. They have visited the museum a number of times. We're very helpful in our Holocaust exhibit when we were building that at Split Rock Studios. And we are thrilled to be the recipient of their yearly award. Someday, sooner than we'd like, the headline will read, Last World War II Veteran Dies. When that day comes, how will we connect the greatest generation with the latest generation? Restoring these things to their original power and function and capturing the stories of those members of the greatest generation who are still with us offers not only a portal to the past, but an immortal connection to America's future generations. Repeating that you'll never fall in love 
And everybody keeps retreating But you can't seem to get enough Let my love open the door Let my love open the door Let my love open the door To your heart Let my love open the door Let my love open the door Let my love open the door To your heart